It was a Sunday evening on the 11th of October in 2015, when the RE Bar in Hillingdon in West London was the starting point for one of the most incomprehensible murder cases seen in Britain in the last 20 years. A young man has his throat slashed at the bar. The fatal 14 and a half inch wound stretches from his ear to his chest. The killer flees the country on a private jet chartered by a drug dealer. He evades capture using a string of false identities and becomes one of the world's most wanted fugitives. The scene sounds like something from a movie script, but this was no film. This was very real. An incident that shocked not only the local community, but also people all over the country. The victim was 21-year-old Joshua Hansen, a roadworks planner from West London who was an up-and-coming star within his workplace, who had simply gone out for a drink with friends and didn't come home. So what exactly happened that night? And who was the perpetrator? And how can someone who so ruthlessly kills another man escape from the scene, leave the country and go on the run across Europe undetected for over three years? You are watching OCG TV. We are continuing to build our channel to be the best version it can be. We would truly appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel if you don't already. Chapter 1. A Night Out turned nightmare. On the night of his death, Josh had accompanied his girlfriend to hospital after a close relative of hers had fallen ill. It had been a long evening and after midnight, following several hours at the hospital, the pair decided to join Josh's cousin and best friend for a few drinks at the RE bar. Spirits were high, a DJ was playing R&B music and the friends were dancing. In the moments before the attack, Joshua stood with his back to the wall facing a group of men sitting on a bench. This is when he caught the eye of Shane O'Brien, a stranger who squared up to him and asked, what's your problem? The aggression from O'Brien is clear in the CCTV footage, while a man appears to try to separate the men. Josh was five foot six, while O'Brien was six foot tall and powerfully built. Seconds later, O'Brien, a father of two from the Sutton estate in Ladbroke Grove, West London, pulled out a Stanley knife from his pocket and in a swift downward motion cut Josh's neck and chest, a wound which was later found to be 37 centimetres long. Fellow revellers looked on in horror as Josh stumbled back and tried to quell the bleeding on his neck, while O'Brien put the knife back in the pocket of his khaki Canada Goose jacket soaked in Josh's blood and calmly walked out of the bar across Field End Road towards a white van. What makes this reaction from O'Brien even more unbelievable is that he had only been in the bar for 20 minutes prior to the attack. Josh's body lay in the bar for 15 hours while the police gathered evidence. The CCTV that captured the incident was seized, which was crucial to the investigation. Metropolitan Police raced their engineer across London under blue lights as they knew attempts were being made to destroy it. They quickly determined O'Brien's identity after finding his fingerprints on the cup he had been seen drinking and launched a manhunt with a £10,000 reward. However, the prime suspect was already two steps ahead. Warrants were executed at addresses he was known to have access to in the Ryslip and Ladbroke Grove areas. He was not there, but several knives were recovered, including two other Stanley knives, a flick knife, a machete and a hatchet. Inquiries revealed after attacking Josh, O'Brien left London around lunchtime on Sunday, October 11, and travelled to a holiday park in Cambus Sands in Kent. He had made the arrangements while fleeing the scene in the white van. Around 7pm that evening, O'Brien and a friend went into a local pub. They returned the following night, and in conversation with bar staff, O'Brien said he had a caravan at Cambus Sands. They then left and went to an Indian restaurant for a meal. CCTV images captured O'Brien looking calm and relaxed. On Tuesday, October 13th, O'Brien and a friend drove to Ashford Designer Outlet Retail Park, where CCTV footage showed the movements of their vehicle, a VW Golf. They visited several designer shops. O'Brien was caught on camera carefully selecting and trying on shirts and trousers before paying in cash. He also bought a suitcase and took time to have lunch. 
This was a man clearly unperturbed about carrying out such a callous murder only 48 hours previous. On Wednesday, October 14th, staff at the pub O'Brien had visited saw a police Facebook appeal offering a £10,000 reward to Trace O'Brien and recognised his image. They called police and officers attended to make further inquiries. They calculated that they were approximately 12 hours behind the suspect. However, by then, O'Brien had fled. At 3.02pm the same day, O'Brien left the country from Biggin Hill Airport in a privately chartered twin-engine propeller plane, hired by a man who was later convicted of importing 100 kilograms of cocaine and heroin, as well as 30 encrypted phones. The two Dutch pilots who flew the plane were also jailed, more on them later. Air traffic control records showed its destination was the southeast Netherlands, near the German and Belgian borders. A manhunt was launched to find O'Brien with the help of the National Crime Agency, Europol and Interpol. A European arrest warrant was obtained and O'Brien subsequently placed on most wanted lists across the world. Police rewards for information leading to his arrest and prosecution were raised over time to £50,000. Detectives began to piece together his movements. The private plane had landed at a small airfield in the south of the Netherlands, where O'Brien was refused entry as he didn't have a passport. He took an onward journey to Germany, where he walked across the airfield and vanished. It is believed that O'Brien paid over £15,000 for the redirected flight. It was an incredible turn of events and signified the level of criminality that Shane O'Brien was involved in. Other criminals on the run might borrow the car of a family member or use the phone of a friend. By contrast, jobless O'Brien, who had no bank account but access to seemingly endless funds, had connections with serious criminal associates and was latterly provided with properties and fake identities. Most police manhunts last a few weeks or months and the suspect might flee to another county in the UK relying on family and limited funds. But not Shane O'Brien. The hunt was on, and detectives followed up every single potential sighting. Some were frustratingly intended to distract and mislead the investigation by tying up resources to follow a line of inquiry that came to nothing. However, these were far outweighed by the many well-intentioned calls, and lots were very credible. One in particular, around Christmas in 2017, garnered the attention of detectives when they got a call from a member of the public who said O'Brien was at a tanning shop in West London. It sounded unbelievable, too good to be true, that he could be so close to home. CCTV showed a man who looked very similar to O'Brien, but extensive detective work would discount him. His brother, who went by the nickname Snickers, is also said to have been arrested several times because of his resemblance to Shane and took to carrying a passport to prove his identity. In the months that followed, there were sightings of him in Spain, Thailand and Dubai. Two years passed without much news. The trail had seemingly gone cold. Chapter 2. Three Long Years The family of Josh Hansen was supremely brave and relentless in their pursuit of justice. On every anniversary, there would be media activity around the case, keeping the profile of O'Brien in the public domain in the hope that someone would come forward with information. The lack of news must have been extremely frustrating for the family, with their lives on hold until the culprit of this terrible crime was behind bars. A breakthrough eventually came in February 2017. O'Brien had been arrested for assault in Prague after he was involved in a fight at a nightclub. He gave the Czech officers a fake name, Enzo Melancelli, and by then had changed his appearance, growing out his hair and beard. Incredibly, police in Prague failed to check his fingerprints against European databases and released him on bail, and the mistake wasn't highlighted till some days later. Czech police later denied missing a chance to catch him, saying the Metropolitan Police had not asked European forces to check his fingerprints against its databases until the following June. O'Brien had boxing gloves on him when arrested, and this gave the police leads to follow up, visiting local gyms he frequented and traced a barber who had cut O'Brien's hair several times. 
When police interviewed him, he revealed that O'Brien had claimed he was Australian, but didn't have the accent to match. A tattoo artist in Prague named Tiago, who inked a large tattoo on O'Brien's back in 2016, depicting an owl clutching a skull between its talons, concealing the name of one of his children, an attempt by O'Brien to avoid being caught. He said that O'Brien was anxious to have the menacing image completed as quickly as possible and appeared evasive and on edge when asked about his background during small talk. A statement the tattoo artist gave to police said, He entered my shop and asked if he could have a tattoo done straight away. I asked what he wanted and he said he wanted existing tattoos covered, changed to something completely different. He asked for an owl and a skull, it would cover almost his whole back. He said he was not staying in Prague for too long. The pair agreed to do three sittings over three days, lasting around three hours each. But on the third day, Tiago said, When it came to the third session when I started tattooing, he cried like a baby and said it was really painful. He said he would come back the next day as he would spend more time in Prague as he had found a job. I asked him what did he do here. He looked like he didn't want to tell me. I could see he didn't want to talk about it. He said he was from Italy, then said his parents were from Italy and he was from Ireland. What motivated O'Brien to kill remained a mystery. Police had investigated a whole range of possible theories and concluded it was an unprovoked attack. There was no previous relationship between the pair. During his time on the run, O'Brien is believed to have visited the Netherlands, Dubai and Prague where he had affairs with women, went to boxing gyms and visited nightclubs. After the connection was made to Prague, British detectives paid a visit to some local boxing clubs in the area who had confirmed he had visited their premises. O'Brien, the son of a postman, grew up on an estate near prison and had two children with his partner who ran a children's fashion business. Some speculated he was being hidden by family members in Ireland or the West Indies. His father, Jerry, moved to Martinique more than a decade ago after falling for another woman. However, police were informed that he hadn't spoken to his dad for many years. His cousin, a man called Jason Manners, was jailed for 14 years for possessing a gun and helping to run a £10 million cocaine ring. His friend, Joseph Peel, believed to be the associate who helped him flee, however unproven, was jailed for 16 years in 2016 for smuggling cocaine and heroin worth £12 million from Holland to Britain by helicopter. Both were residents of Sutton Way, the West London estate where O'Brien grew up. The Dutch pilots, Niels Wartenberg and Ricardo Vorstenbosch, were both jailed for 18 years. Chapter 3. The Breakthrough it was late on Thursday, March 21st of this year, when DCI Noel McHugh of the National Crime Agency was called by O'Brien's lawyer, who said O'Brien was considering handing himself in and wanted him to travel to Budapest to personally meet him. The immediate thought was why. He could have walked into any police station and handed himself in as one of the world's most wanted men. Was this a trick to waste more time and resources? getting McHugh out there only to find he was long gone somewhere else. The plan changed and police were told the meeting location was now Romania. Detectives were then able to alert the Romanian authorities, who then notified local patrol officers. This eventually led to his arrest in the middle of a busy street, detained with three mobile phones and counterfeit documentation. On his person, he had a false Danish passport, false residence permit, driving license, credit cards in the names of others, and three mobile phones. The relentless pursuit from the British authorities had paid dividends. The publicity generated in the years since he absconded had made O'Brien a heavy target. With some of his key gangland connections locked up, it was likely that he was running out of financial support. It was the news that the family of Josh had been waiting for, and they would eventually get their day in court, a chance to close this chapter and focus on remembering their beloved son and brother. O'Brien told his murder trial he felt threatened by Mr. Hansen, who he felt was ready to attack by apparently aggressive body language and staring into his eyes. He said they were not aware of each other at that point 
that said after he and his three friends sat down, it became apparent, in O'Brien's words, they weren't happy with his sitting at that table and that the situation seemed hostile. As footage around three minutes before the attack was played, prosecutor Mark Haywood QC asks, there is no hostility there? Where was the hostility at this stage? O'Brien replied, that bar is very small, just body language can create an atmosphere. Mr. Haywood said, it can if you're looking for it, Mr. O'Brien. O'Brien told the court he wanted to pretend to attack Mr. Hansen with a knife bought from B&Q earlier that day to scare him, adding, from the bottom of my heart, I did not mean to touch him with that blade. Jurors heard that O'Brien accepted he used the blade to cause Mr. Hansen's death, but says he is not criminally responsible because he did not mean to kill him. They were ultimately not convinced. O'Brien was found guilty after a deliberation of only 53 minutes. He was subsequently given a life sentence with the recommendation that he serve a minimum of 26 years before considered for parole. There were angry shouts of coward from the public gallery as he was led away from the dock. Detective Chief Inspector Noel McHugh, who led the investigation for the NCA, commented outside of the court that O'Brien thought he could evade justice with the help of his associates, but he was wrong. It is only now, upon sentence, that it's sinking in, that O'Brien has finally been caught and convicted and will be off the streets, away from society, for a very long time.